Now let's continue to pray a little bit here this morning, get our hearts set and our hearts ready to uh, receive God's word this morning. So God, I just pray right now that you would open my spiritual eyes and spiritual ears. God, that you would speak to me through your word this morning, oh God. Lord, just stir deeply within my heart my affections for Jesus, my affections for you, and my affections for your word. So, Holy Spirit, we're asking you to do what only you can do, and that's to bring transformation into our hearts and into our lives this morning, O oh Lord. God, our desire is that you'll be glorified in everything that's done right here and right now. That our hearts would continue to stay tuned into worship as we study your word. So, God, we ask to come into your presence right now, fully into your presence that we may hear from you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to imagine for a moment with me, if you would, what it must have been like for Adam and Eve, the very beginning, before they committed what's called the original sin. Think about that for just a moment. Perfect environment, the perfect marriage until the first sin, perfect relationship with God, everything was perfect. Now, how did everything go wrong if everything was perfect? You see, because Genesis chapter 3 is where everything went wrong, and there are volumes and volumes and volumes of books about theology that are written just on Genesis chapter 3 because it helps us understand our relationship with God, how we relate to Him, how sin relates to us, and how sin messes everything up in our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. Dealing with disappointment is what we're going to talk about this morning. So here's the, here's the see that the devil always comes with a seed of disappointment to plant in your mind. And here, here Eve is in this perfect environment, and here's the seed of disappointment that he sows into her mind. He says, now God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat, referring to the forbidden fruit. And you will be like God. Now, let me ask you a question. Was she like God before she ate the forbidden fruit? She was created in God's image. She was more like God than ever. Matter of fact, now let me ask you this. Was she more like God after she ate the forbidden fruit? <laughs> Quite the opposite. And, and, that's, the, that, and that's, the, that's the temptation from Satan. It's always that you will be better off. This is what you deserve. You will be happy now. This will, this will bring you fulfillment when in truth... The temptation always does just the opposite when we fall into that lie, into that seed of disappointment. And he says, you'll know you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. But see, here's what you have to understand. Our understanding of how God works in our life is so wrong in our westernized version of Christianity today. See, there's a reason why the prosperity gospel has done so well in our world. Because it's in our nature to believe that if I do good things, if I'm a good person or whatever that may mean, you know, if I go to church and all this, then as a result, God's going to do good things for me. I'm going to live a good, comfortable life here in this world. When in fact, Jesus said just the opposite. So, I mean, we've taken the good gospel in the Bible, and we perverted it in our Christianity today to thinking if, oh, if you're a good person or a good Christian, then things will go good for you in this world. Jesus said just the opposite. Look at this. I've told you all this. All the teachings, he said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace, not in this world, notice, the peace. Well, oh, it's only in Jesus. What's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy. He said, here on earth, this is it, this life right here. It doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter how good of a person you think you are or whatever, a good Christian, whatever that may be. Jesus said there's none good except for God alone. That good, that's our, that's our church religion junk. Here on earth, you will, look at this, definite. In the Greek, it's a definite article. You will have many trials and sorrows. You will, it's inevitable. Oh, but see... This is like a New Testament proverb. It's going to start off with something good, give you the struggle, and then give you the good at the end right here. But see, listen, take heart, because 
I have overcome the world. See, our problem today, dear friend, is that we are so short-sighted. We're just focused in on right here and right now. We talk about this all the time. We talk about disappointment in life. And here's, here's a definition just out of the dictionary. Sadness or displeasure caused by the non-fulfillment of one's hopes oh, or expectations. And that leads us to something else we talk about, that expectation gap. What I expected and what I'm getting, the reality. And then this, this, and this is the most important place where we live right here. This gap between what I expected, what I thought I was going to get, what I hoped for, whatever it may be, and then the reality of where I live, that gap right there, that's how I respond. See, that, that really, that's, that's where I am spiritually, if I really am spiritually mature. You see, because here's our situation. I know this from experience. I have known a lot of people who go to church that know a lot about the Bible and are very, very emotionally immature. But I have not ever known anybody who was spiritually mature that was emotionally immature. It's a difference. See, we gotta, we got to get a difference right here and understand. Because, see, many of you have been disappointed with church and church people because you naturally assumed that because someone had a position of authority or they knew a lot about the Bible that they were emotionally mature when they were not. And they were mean to you and they hurt your feelings. And you're disappointed. And because of that disappointment with that preacher or that, that leader in church or that other church person, whatever it may be, now it, 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 it spirals into something. See, it's the same seed that the enemy came and planted in Eve's mind. It always begins with disappointment. So this morning you may be sitting here, dear friend, with disappointment in your heart and in your mind. And let's, let's address this. Let's let the Lord address this through the power of his Holy Spirit and his word. Here's our text this morning. This is Acts. We're going verse by verse to the book of Acts. <laughs> by the way, I did not want to do this. Speaking of doing what, doing what God wants us to do, this is a marriage right here, man. You, know, you realize if we go at this pace, we'll be going through the book of Acts for a couple of years. <laughs> so here we've got the Acts chapter 1, just right after the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. He has commanded the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for power from on high. So they're obeying here, and it says, then they return to Jerusalem. So they're being obedient to the word of the Lord. It's very important, verse number one, because I want to share this morning with you. These guys were disappointed, even though they just experienced the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. There was disappointment among their ranks. So let me show you why. Because, listen, you got to hear this this morning. Sometimes everything can go right and you can still experience disappointment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, don't you? Sometimes I mean, it's like, why am I so feeling this way when everything, this is what I always dreamed of, and now I feel disappointment? Okay, so they return. It's about a Sabbath day's journey. It's about a half to three quarters of a mile. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. And of course, this is not Judas Iscariot. And we'll even address that in just a moment. Judas Iscariot is out of the picture as far as there. Okay, so they were, here it is. They were continually, see, interesting right here. This is, a, this is an interesting Greek word right here that I wanted to share with you this morning. It's actually a compound word right here. It's humo thumadon. Humothudamon. And what this means, it's kind of like a whole bunch of musical instruments that are all playing different sounds in the same key, in the same melody, making a beautiful sound. So, so when it says right here that they were all together, see, they were all together in one mind, with one accord, and with one passion in prayer. Let me tell you something. Whenever a group of people come together in one accord in prayer, that is an unstoppable force. You do, you do realize something that the enemy, what he wants to do is sow discord among us. To make us we're, 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 once again, you've got to understand something. All throughout North America this morning, there are churches just like us that are gathered together having church. And here's what we don't realize. In all, not all of them, but in many of our churches, or some of our churches, I don't know, but I know they're in some, witches 
have been dispatched to church services. And they're sitting in church. And you know what they're trying to do? So discord. Just keep things from being unified. They can't stop the church. But they can, they can, they can stop the unity of prayer, the unity of worship, the unity among brothers and sisters. See, because that's what the enemy wants to do. So I, you just you must understand this this morning. Please understand this. Whenever we get at odds with one another, that is not the Holy Spirit working in and through us. The enemy wants us to be disunified, to be split, to break, even to sit here in the same church and to be rubbed raw by the other person sitting in here with us. Because when that happens, that squashes the unity. And when the unity is squashed, then that prohibits. If for some reason, the Holy Spirit can't move like it can if we're unified. So I'm telling you this morning, this, if you're sitting here and there's disappointment set in, it's moving in, and be careful with that. Know something, that, that disappointment isn't from God. So they were all continually united in prayer along with the women. And I want to put out this, including Mary, this is, of course, the mother of Jesus. Last time you'll see her mentioned in the Bible is in a prayer meeting. And they're not praying to her, by the way. She's praying to God. Mary the mother of Jesus, and look at this, the last time we had seen his brothers mentioned, they were non-believers. <laughs> What's happened? Now why are they in together with all the other praying to their brother, half-brother? Well, let me tell you what's happened. The resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead changed everything. I hope, I hope that whenever the new year begins every year that you get excited about Easter coming. Like some of your kids and grandkids get excited about Christmas, you should be getting excited about Easter because Resurrection Sunday is a big event for us. That's what changed everything. That's what changed everything for them, and that's what changes everything for us. He is alive. He is risen. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. Uh, the number of the people who were together were about 120. Okay, so... Why does Luke point out that there's 120 people here? Well, it's very interesting because in Jewish culture, if you were going to begin a new community, it was required that you had 120 people. So they all, he got up and he, he said, hey, brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled. Now, that is so true because we still have scripture yet to be fulfilled in our future. The whole book of Revelation is yet to be fulfilled. And here's what I want to present to you this morning. It will be fulfilled exactly as it has been written. Every prophecy in the Bible has always been fulfilled exactly as it was prophesied, and it will continue to do that because it is the living word of God. It's different than any other book you'll ever read. That the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of David, foretold about Judas, and this is Judas Iscariot he's talking about now, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So Peter, at the moment, and come on, now listen to me, church. At the moment, whenever, whenever Judas Iscariot led the band out there to arrest Jesus, Peter didn't stand in front of everybody and go, hey, wait a second, this has all been foretold in Scripture, you know, this is going to happen. What did Peter do? He pulled out a sword and tried to chop, the, tried to bust the dude's head open. He started fighting right there in the moment. But now, after the resurrection, death, burial, resurrection, he's had time to reflect and look on it and says, wait a second, now, this has all had to be fulfilled by Scripture. This was all meant to happen. And listen, I know that we flippantly throw out Romans 8, 28, for we know that in all things God works for the good to those that love him, to those that are called according to his purpose. But you have to understand something. That's exactly what Peter's saying on this day. That, hey, in that moment, I came unraveled. I don't know if you're hearing me this morning. I don't know if you've experienced this this morning. In that moment, I came unraveled. It seemed as if our world came undone. When they arrested Jesus and they crucified him, we thought it was all done. It was bad. But now I see that the worst, my worst moment actually became my best moment. It set up, listen, the death set up the resurrection three days later. I see sometimes it's whenever you lose all hope. It's whenever your life has been dashed on the rocks that God is just setting you up for something that you could never, ever imagine. Verse 17. 
For he was, and here's the part right here that we just gloss over church, and I want, I want us to ease into this this morning and feel the emotion of this story. Here's what he says. He was one of our number. Hey, now notice Peter didn't say, man, that dude was a scoundrel from the very beginning. I knew something was up with him. When I looked at him, he had funny looking eyes, and I just knew. He, didn't. he was the dude that was in charge of the money. The most trusted one among the apostles. No one looked at him whenever they were walking around, and they're like, man, this dude. In hindsight, they could. But in the moment, they didn't. In the moment, he was one of them. He was, they would say, our brother. He shared in this. Do you realize something? Judas Iscariot watched Jesus walk on water just like all the rest of them. He saw, them feed, he saw him feed the 5,000. He saw him heal the blind, the lame. He saw him raise the dead back to life again. Judas Iscariot was present for every single one of those miracles. And here's what I want to tell you this morning. I want to present to you this morning. Be sure that you understand this. Signs and wonders never transform someone's heart. I mean, if, that was, if that's all it takes, then why on earth do we got one of the greatest miracles in the Bible? It's the crossing of the Red Sea. They get to the other side and they have a praise service. Man, you think, all right, man, this group of people, they are set. And a few days later, God, listen, God brings Moses up on the mountain, has given him the Ten Commandments, and what do they do down in the valley? They start burning all the gold and making idol worship, and they have the most horrific kind of party you can possibly have, by the way. So when Moses comes back down, he sees what they're doing. He breaks the axe or breaks those first tablets. So why, if miracles is all we need, then that would have transformed them right there. Realize something, folks. Hey, listen, it's not signs and wonders we need. It's a transforming power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. That's what we need. I don't need another good sermon. I don't need another good church service. I need the Holy Spirit moving in my heart. That's what I need. And apart from that, we're just wasting our time. But I want you to look at this. He shared, man. See, some of you, you have served in church with someone that was near and dear to you. And not only did they leave the church, but they left the faith. And if you've ever experienced that before, that can be a crushing blow. Someone that you served and prayed with and worked with side by side. And not only did they leave the church, but they, but they say, no, I'm no longer not even going to church. I don't even believe in God. I'm now an atheist. Man, that is a hard deal to work through right there. And you've got to understand something. For these apostles, do you realize something? You've got you to hear this. The whole community was talking about this. Hey, wait a second. If Jesus is going to be the Messiah, if he really is a son of God and all this, what about that Judas dude? I mean, he, he chose him. And I mean, he was the one that even handled the money. I mean, if he really was God, wouldn't he know this dude was bad? And laugh at him while they were saying that? So don't think for a moment that, don't just gloss over this and just fly through this text right here and be like, oh man, they had it all figured out. No, they hurt. They felt the full brunt of the pain of this. Their brother doing this. They didn't see this coming. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages. He fell head first, his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out, talking about the way that Judas Iscariot died. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, and there they are. They're like, man, this has been an embarrassment to us. So in their own language, that field was called Hegedomai, that is, field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it, and let someone else take, its, take his position. So he's going back to scripture once again, and, and here's what he says. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from among these, it is necessary that one become a witness with us of the resurrection. And that is the most important thing for them. When they, when they were formulating and they're saying, okay, we got to get one more apostle to take Judas's place. We got to have someone who is a witness of the resurrection. Because once again, the resurrection is the most important aspect of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So they proposed to Joseph, 
called Barsabbas. Now, that's Sabbath right here. Son of Sabbath is what his name means. Probably born on a Sabbath is what we guess. Who is also known as Justice and Matthias. So I got these two guys together, and here's what happens. Then they prayed. Well, they prayed. Notice they're praying, and they're praying, and they're praying. Then they prayed. You, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen. And here's where it gets a little weird for us. To take the place of this apostolic ministry that Judas left to go where he belongs, and that's a very nice way of saying, okay, yeah, we'll leave it right there. We've got children in the room. They, then they cast lots for them. That's where it gets kind of weird for us. They cast lots. So in casting lots, what they would do is they would take the two names, they'd put them on two rocks, they'd put them in a jar, they'd shake the jar around, and the first name that came out would be the one that they would discern that this is the one that God had chosen. Now, you have to understand, that's the last time you see this happening in the Bible. Because in the next chapter, the coming of the Holy Spirit, now God wants us to discern by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives, not by casting lots anymore. So here's the situation. I have grown up in church culture and heard this sermon preached many, many times. And some of you are going to be, oh, yeah, I've heard that sermon, too. That said, these apostles were out of God's will when they did this. And I want to present to you that they may not have been out of God's will when they did this because they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they followed biblical prescription for everything before the coming of the Holy Spirit like all the rest of their predecessors had done. And here's the, here's the argument that all the sermons that I've heard in church culture growing up is that, well, we never hear of Matthias once again because what happens is the lot fell on Matthias and he was added to the 11 apostles. But here's what you have to understand also. Most of the other apostles are never named again either. So, where do they get this from? Well, out of the Proverbs, it says the lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. So before the Holy Spirit, they are following scriptural protocol, and they're praying, and they're asking for God's discernment on this. So let me just, let me just throw that out there. This is, this is not a hill that I would die on. It's no big deal. I know that we've all, some of you have heard sermons the other way, but I just want to present to you that maybe I believe, and many other Bible scholars believe, that they were following God's discernment and God's will in choosing Matthias to replace Judas. But here's the most important thing. Jesus said, it's necessary for me to go because unless I go, I cannot send to you the advocate, the Holy Spirit. And you're going to be better off with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is going to be entering into every single one of you. I don't, okay, so let me ask you this. Are you in Christ Jesus? You sit here right now and you say, yes, I am in Christ Jesus. That means the very Holy Spirit of God is inside of you. Everywhere you go, every moment of your life, God is right there inside of you. You don't have to go somewhere to go find God. God is in you. And that's good news right there. So a few days before this event, I'm going to go back to Luke. Luke's the one who wrote the book of Acts. And Luke tells a very interesting story about some disappointed disciples. After the death, burial, and even the resurrection, these two, these two disciples are what's called on the road to Emmaus. They're going back. They left Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They're going back to their hometown, Emmaus. And as they're going along, they're all depressed and all upset and all disappointed because they think, man, this did not work out the way that we expected. Our expectation gap got cracked crushed whenever Jesus was crucified on the cross. And they're walking along, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes walking along beside them. Jesus asked them, hey, what are you discussing so intensely as you walk along? They stopped short. Sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleophas, replied, and you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there these last few days. What things, Jesus asked? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. Man, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was mighty. He was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. Uh, was he a prophet? Well, he was the Messiah. He is God. He's much more than a prophet. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death they crucified him. I mean, that's, in their minds, the worst thing could have happened. I mean, like, they, they, they would be okay with anybody other than the religious leaders doing it. 
because they understood me, Jesus is the Messiah, so that's all part of our religious system. We had hoped, and there's the disappointment. See, our hopes got dashed. Our expectation gap got crushed because what we expected and what we got were two different things. We, we hoped, we expected that he was a Messiah who had come to risk, rescue Israel, and, and this all happened three days ago. And did he come to rescue Israel? Yes, but much more than Israel, he came to rescue the whole entire world. And if he didn't come to the whole world, you and I wouldn't be sitting in here talking about him right now today. 2,000 years later, the other side of the world, a whole different culture, a whole different language. And he saved you. Not just Israel. This isn't a political thing. It is much more. It is a personal thing. Then some women from our group, and here's where the tone changes. I mean, if they're telling the story, they're all excited. Then some women from the group. His followers were at the tomb early that morning. They came back with this amazing report. They said, key, they said, and I'm like, I'm not saying, I'm not believing it, but this is what they said, that his body was missing. <laughs> they had seen angels who had told them Jesus was alive. That's, that's my sanctified imagination, them telling the story, by the way. Some of our men ran out to see him, and sure enough, his body was gone just as the women had said. Now, here's why I think they told the story like that, because listen to what Jesus says to them. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe. So that tells me right there that they weren't believing what they were saying. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Because listen, folks, what it comes down to more than anything is what this says. Not what I say, what this says. Not what a church or a denomination says, what this says. This is the, um, this is the authority above all of us. So he takes them back, look, he says that he takes them back, all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And here's the thing, it was not clear to them. They, the, whole, the whole suffering ser servant aspect of the prophecies, it's like they were blind to it. All they saw was him coming like David and being a king and restoring Israel. They didn't see the whole suffering servant part of it. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets of so the Old Testament, because that's all they would have at this time, of course, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself, showing them the suffering servant prophecies from the Old Testament, no doubt. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay a night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. So realize, they're, they're still not recognizing who this is. They're thinking this is just some dude explaining Bible verses to them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it. That means he prayed. Oh, no, no, listen. I'm going to say it over and over again until you get sick of hearing me say this. Prayer changes everything, and it changes you. It doesn't change God. It changes you. It changes your perspective. So whenever he broke that bread and he prayed, and he gave it to them, suddenly their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. And I love this. They said to each other, I mean, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? I mean, wasn't something stirring that whole time he was talking to us? And it was Jesus in the flesh talking to them. Oh, but see, listen, don't miss this. They missed it because of the seed of disappointment had taken over. Because when disappointment takes over, the very Spirit of God can be stirring in your heart and you'll miss it. You can be right there and God speaking loud and clear and you don't hear it. See, disappointment always leads, if we let it go, to discouragement. And discouragement always leads to disillusionment. It's like, man, why am I even going to church? Why am I even reading my Bible? Why am I, every, I'm reading my Bible. Why am I praying? It just gets, everything gets worse anyway. Why don't I even go to church, man? All people, all church people are the same. 
And it goes into depression. It takes over from there. It goes all the way to the physical, emotional, spiritual aspect. And then the enemy gets us right where he wants us. And we are defeated. We're out. We're done. We're through. I'll never go back. I'll never try again. Hopelessness has taken over. You do realize that's where the enemy wants you, right? So as I always say, and I'll say it again and again, and again, the first step is always prayer. It begins, and it continues, and it ends with prayer. If there's ever anybody that offers to teach you how to pray, I highly recommend you take them up. If you want to read a new book and grow spiritually, read a book about prayer. Go, go to, go to wildatheart.com. Go to their app. Look at their prayers. Read their prayers. Learn how to pray. That's the most valuable thing you'll ever do in this life. So I mean, if I'm going to overcome, that disappointment leaves me all the way down to the part where I'm down and I'm out and everything like that. The only way back begins with prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. I've got to be praying. And then as I start praying, I'm continuing in prayer. It's going to help me to, to get my right position in Christ Jesus. Now, you hear me say this all the time. Ephesians 2, 6, we are seated with Christ, past tense. We're seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenlies. You're already there, past tense, in Christ May I show you another one, though? Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. And I, man, this I right here is so huge. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me because I've got to be crucified to that big I in my life. Because, listen, God, God, the Scriptures are very clear. When I make it all about me, and that's what the devil wants me to do, then I'm always going to go the wrong way. The, the, listen, the original sin, what did, what did Satan say to Eve? You will be better off. You'll be like God. Come on, eat it. Anybody ever told you you walk around this place naked? You say, well, David, you're getting a little carried away with the story now. Well, wait a second. When God came to Adam and Eve after they did this, he said, who told you you was naked? So maybe I'm getting carried away with the story, but I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, man, he was putting doubt and discouragement in her mind. And that's going to, the prayer position, it's going to help change my perspective so we don't focus on what is seen. Hey, church, listen, are you focused on what's been seen right now in your culture you live in? Oh, boy, this is going to be a bad week. We need to be praying and praying over this week. Yeah, it is. It's going to be a rough week. Yeah, we do need to be praying over that. But I'm not going to focus on what is seen. I mean, I'm commanded from the Word of God, don't focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. No government and no election can overturn what God's doing and what God is going to do. The scripture must be fulfilled. Let's just say what Peter said. It's going to be fulfilled. You can't stop God. No man can stop God. No political system can stop God. No country can stop God. It's never out of his control. God ended up there twiddling his thumb thinking, man, I sure hope it all works out okay. And that brings transformation. Now, I couldn't be cute and keep on with the peas right here. I ran out of peas, so I had to go. <laughs> Don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 2. See, this is changing. That's that transformation. When that, when, man, when, I, when that discouragement and that disappointment got me going the wrong direction, then it's going to end in joy, Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy. And here, remember, let, let's just reframe joy. Joy is not based on circumstances. Joy is not a feeling. That's happiness. Happiness is based on circumstances and has to do with just a feeling of being happy in the moment. Joy is having a true, lasting happiness regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what happens. That, that's joy. Joy is based on a relationship with God, not on my circumstances. So I'm asking you once again, are you disappointed? Have you been disappointed? I mean, there's been just something right now as you sit here, you say, man, I, David, listen, I am very disappointed. Well, here's what the enemy wants you to do is to fill that gap with one letter. Make it all about you. Because when you make it all about you, he can make you all about miserable. 
But when I put Jesus in there and I fill that up, and I know you come to church and you're like, oh, yeah, that's what the preacher's going to do. Tell us put Jesus in the front of him and everything. You know, Jesus, 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 pray, pray, pray. The answer to everything. Yep, it is. <laughs> that's right. As goofy as it sounds, that is right. That is the answer to everything. Because when Jesus is in the center, then it's what changes all of a sudden, I've got an eternal perspective, and it's all about relationships, and it's not about me. It's about my relationship with God. It's about my relationship with my wife, with, with my children, my grandchildren, with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's about dying to what I want and what I think I need and what I think I deserve and becoming more of a servant. See, that's what Jesus was. Jesus came to serve. He laid down his life, no greater love. Than there is someone to lay down his life for a friend, but even how much more for an enemy in Christ. When we were opposed to the cross, he served us so much that he died willingly, gave his life for us so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be free, so we could walk in joy. perspective. <laughs> you know the story in the Old Testament of Joseph, his brothers threw him down the well, was leaving him for dead. One of them, they saw a band of slave traders coming by, and one of them was like, no, man, let's make some money off of him. Let's don't just leave him here for dead. Pulled him up and sold him as a slave. It's a tremendous story. Mm -hmm. he, he goes and becomes a slave of Potiphar, one of the most powerful men in Egypt. And Potiphar's wife falsely accuse him, accuses him, and he, he's trying to stay away from doing the right thing. And she grabs his jacket and yanks it off, and she shows the Potiphar and said, he tried to rape me, and quite the opposite, she was trying to do that to him. And he goes to a dungeon prison. Is it 13 years? A bunch of years. I thought I heard somebody give the numbers. I don't know the bunch. And then... God raises him up out of there and makes him the second most powerful man in Egypt, which Egypt was the most powerful country in the world. And his brothers are starving, and they have to come back to Egypt because that's the only, where, the only place they can find food. And guess who God put in charge of the distribution of all the food? Joseph. His brothers come walking back up there, and they don't recognize him. Look at the parallel of the story of the people on the road to Emmaus that didn't recognize Jesus, and they don't recognize their brother. All he's got to do is just take his staff and point it at him, and they execute his brothers right there on the spot. Total, man, there's the best revenge movie of all right there. <laughs> Wops them out. We're all like plotting. See, yeah, they got it. Rotten, sorry dudes. <laughs> but he does just the opposite. And at the very end, man, they're like, they're, they're, they, his brothers come before him, and here's what he says. As for you, you meant evil against me. He's like, man, you didn't deny it. When you, pull, when you threw me down in there, when you pulled me out and you sold me as a slave, you, knew, you, you, you intended for me to die. You just want to get a few bucks off of me. You intended it for evil. Let's don't gloss over it. Oh, but God. God meant it for good. To bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. How can God... Take something that someone meant against you to destroy you and turn it not only to keep you, but to save other people. That's the amazing thing about our God. And that's what Peter's saying out there on this day as we're reading in Acts as he's looking around all the rest of the He said, listen, don't be surprised. Don't be disappointed. Don't be discouraged. The scriptures had to be fulfilled. It had to go this way. It never got out of God's control. And it's not today. We will be okay. Because we have got an eternal perspective. This is not about us and getting what we want. This is about God and his glory. Would you please stand this morning? Hey, so um, whoever's on the computer back there, would you put my clicker back on, please? There we are.
So let me ask you something this morning. Are, is there, are you anywhere in here? Uh, are you disappointed in your marriage? You may think, man, I didn't sign up for this. Are you saying, man, I would give anything to get out if God would just give me an out? Got myself into a mess here. Are you discouraged over your job? Are you discouraged over your health? You discouraged over your finances? Are you discouraged because you look at our future and think, man, where do we go from here? Let me remind you, be careful with that. That seed is not planted in your mind by the Holy Spirit. And we must be very careful because we know where this ends. So this morning I want to pray with you before we leave out. So I want to pray for you right now if the whole marriage thing is unraveling or unraveled. And maybe you're here and you've been through divorce or whatever and you think, man, <laughs> I am way past the feet right now. Well, I would encourage you to remember the stories we just looked at. It's never a hopeless situation when God's in, in, in control. You are not hopeless. Your life is not hopeless. Your circumstances are not hopeless. Jesus, his specialty is hopeless people and hopeless situations. So would you pray right now, Jesus, I ask you to take over. I just surrender my life right here and right now. Hey, listen, if you're single and you don't see any hope, then here's what I want to ask you to pray. Jesus, help me take every thought captive to your obedience. Help me to, to dwell on what is true, what is good, what is lovely. And help me to remember that you're in control. Help me to remember that I'm never alone. And I trust you that you will lead me to where I need to be. Not where I want to be. So I fully trust you with my life. If your marriage is coming unraveled, then here's what I want you to pray. I invite you to pray this. God, just stir my affections for you. Stir my spouse's affections for you. Our affections for each other. If you have children, our affections for our children. Our affections for the church. And our affections for our calling that you have for us. You see, because dear friend, the enemy wants to destroy every single one of those. He wants to destroy God's image in your life. He wants to destroy your affections for God and for your spouse and for your children. He wants to destroy your calling. So maybe there's some other area of your life right now you feel disappointment, discouragement, all these things setting in. Maybe it's your job, your finances, your health. So God, I come before you and I lay before you and just lay just right there in your heart right now, whatever that is. I surrender this over to you, Lord. 
Help me to let go, to stop trying to control. And I willingly give you total control of this. It's yours. My life is yours. And I submit my life to the authority rule of Jesus. God, I ask you to fill my heart and my mind with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Help me to be more spiritually mature in the way I respond to this. So God, we love you, Lord. We need thee every hour. We need thee. God, we thank you that you're sovereign, that you're in control. God, help us today to take what we've learned. Holy Spirit, we ask you to move it out of our mind and into our heart, bring transformation. Help us to mature. Put a strong desire in our heart to pray, to learn to pray, to dig into prayer this week. So if you're disappointed, dear friend, let me remind you, the first step out is prayer. So I would encourage you to begin to pray this morning. Pray every day as much as you can without ceasing. Pray and pray and pray. It's not about praying that your circumstances change, but it's praying that God's going to give you the grace to grow and to strengthen your faith in spite of your circumstances. You may be seated. You know, as we talk about disappointment and all these things right here, there's one aspect that is overarching, most important aspect of our community here at the Bridge Fellowship, and that is our home groups. You know, I would say this, if, and especially if you're struggling in your marriage, are you in a home group? Are you plugged in with other believers? See, when you're isolated, that's right where the enemy wants you to be. The reason we have home groups is so you will be plugged in, so you can be ministered to, so you can be a part of the community. Because, listen, you need much more than what happens here on Sunday morning. Here, you need to be part of a home group. What's that? That's the only announcement. Our home groups. Now, Nikki's going to come give the announcement that our home groups are starting back. And <laughs> she's like, you just did it right there. You know, why are you trying to get me up there? So our home groups are starting today back. So if you're not a part of the home, a home group, then do we have sign-ups sign ups out in the foyer. So sign up for a home group. Get plugged into a home group. Let's all stand. We'll be dismissed with a word of prayer this morning. Chuck, would you dismiss us with a word of prayer just right there where you're standing, please, sir?